Hello and welcome to another episode of the Steady Out Chronicles podcast. I'm your host today and I'm Mina Razuki. And as always, I am joined by Nikki Bandini and Patrick Kendrick. But before I go to them and ask them how their week has been, whether they've cried over any other matches, I want to tell you, dear listener, that this is a reminder of our free seven-day trial of our Chronicles to Fozy Patreon membership. So you can get access to all full episodes 100% ad-free, plus bonuses such as videos and behind-the-scenes content. There's a bunch of interesting things to look at, like me applying makeup, someone drinking water, but, you know, you might find this interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the show. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't cried in any football recently, but I have been... <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about Arsenal on here because for Serie A Chronicles, but I have been enjoying Arsenal going back top of the table. So the crying comes later. The crying comes when we lose to Tottenham and it all goes wrong. Don't cry for me, Patrick. Argentina. Paolo Di Bala. We'll get on to that, I think, as well. No, I, I, was, I was slightly emotional last night when Inter scored in the last minute, not because I'm a closet Nerazzurri fan, but because... It must be. I was, uh, I was very excited in, from, a, from a purely sort of business standpoint putting my professional hat on, which let's be honest, is always pretty, pretty f nearby. Um, I was very pleased because of, from a narrative perspective, I love the fact that Inter can win the, uh, the Scudetto in the derby. Whereas had they drawn against Udinese and they ended up winning with a last minute goal, then we might've had this weird situation whereby Milan won in Reggio Emilia and then Inter could have gone the golfing equivalent of five up with five to play from a sort of match play perspective, because they might've been 15 they would win the derby to go 15 clear with only five matches remaining. So now they can win the Scudetto. And I quite like the idea that Milan are going to be especially motivated to deny them the Scudetto by winning the derby. So that's why I was a little bit um, emotional, yeah, by Wait, the Fratesi goal. Wait, is that what we think? Do we think, that, do we think that Milan can stop them? I we think it's certainly a possibility. Week. They're not going to stop them forever. But the, the idea of whether or not the title gets won there will add some spice to that game at least. Okay, I'm just putting it right here. Like, I'm just putting it out there. Like, if, if Pioli does this, if he wins that match, then everyone needs to come on here and sing Pioli's on fire. Because this <laughs> man has been so harshly criticised this season that I think it's time to fly that flag and see and talk about how brilliant he is and how much he's yeah. just not recognised for what he's done. But, oh, I do sort of want to talk about this. And, you know, I do feel a little bit sorry for Udinese as well. I mean, it's heartbreaking. Fratesi is that kind of threat that... Fratesi belongs to Cagliari, right? Like, they love these last-minute goals. <laughs> but <laughs> we should start with the biggest game of the weekend, and it's got to be the Derby della Capitale. Of course, this isn't between Jose Mourinho and Maurizio Sarri anymore. Um, so it wasn't Lazio winning as usual. It was Daniele De Rossi's Roma who walked away with a 1-0 victory over Igor Tudor, La <laughs> Igor Tudor's Lazio. And producer Simon is so excited he wanted us to create, you know, a mammoth amount of podcasts on how wonderful Roma is and Daniele De Rossi is. And <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so let's start with the biggest match of the season. Gianluca Mancini is the man who, who gets the goal for Roma. And I'll be honest with you guys, this was a spicy game in the second half. But we all looked at this before and thought, on paper, Roma's the better team, right? I think that's what we said when we talked about it um, beforehand. I, I definitely expected Roma to win. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a great derby. Um, it wasn't. The football wasn't vintage. It was. It was a, a scrappy game. Um, and Roma were the better team, but they were not their compelling best. They've been better than this under De Rossi for certain. Um, they definitely look like what they are, which is a team that's had a manager in in the door for more than five minutes, and so was a bit more coherent. Um, I I think there were the, there were things that you recognised in that team. You went, yes, these are a, a clear marks of, of what De Rossi's done. I think the um, obvious part of that being the the interactions between Pellegrini and Dybala and um, and and the fullback on on the right hand side. Just all of those sort of interactions, the ability to to swap places is so much smoother than it was under Mourinho. There was much more positivity than I think um, we've seen in these uh, games under Mourinho and that's kind of the big thing I mean you touched on it there and it's impossible <laughs> not to frame this as it's the post Mourinho and Sarri derby because Mourinho lost four out of six derbies he drew another one so only won once and it's not a coincidence he got fired six days after losing Zabi so the fact is just this was the 
Mourinho's gone. Now we've got De Rossi, we've got the Roman and uh, and what a moment for him getting to, to win one as a manager now as well. That's true, Patrick. I mean, when you think about it, Roma haven't even scored since exactly two years ago. It was March 2022 that they actually played this game and scored goals. And now you look at this and you think, finally, they're starting to show us, you know, what they can do, what they what they are capable of. Did you expect any other result than a, than a Roma win? I think it was just a question whether whether Roma could score and ultimately they needed a set piece to do so. I mean, we've become used to these very tight derbies. You know, we had the the 1-0 win for Lazio in the cup. There were there were a pair of wins for Lazio 1-0 last season. The reverse fixture was goalless. So it had become very turgid. Mourinho was keeping things tight. It's one of those where, you know, they say, I derby non, non si gioco, non si vincono. You know, you don't play derbies, you win them. Actually, what it had become was, I derby non si gioco, non, non si perdono. You know, it was a case of trying to avoid <laughs> defeat so as, you know, for fear of, of the opposition getting, getting one over on you. So as soon as Mancini scored, it did feel like Roma had done most of the heavy lifting because Lazio never looked like scoring that immobile mm. chance, notwithstanding, you know, when that was Mancini actually ironically giving the ball away. But I think it's... um. And the, the derby that you mentioned, that, that there was nice symmetry to it because we, we'd gone full circle because it was uh, the Tammy Abraham derby, that one, when he scored a brace in the 3-0 win and he returned after 10 months on, on the sidelines in the derby against Lazio. So that was a sort of icing on the cake for Roma on what was basically a perfect day, De Rossi winning his first derby in the dugout. I love De Rossi when he said, you know, I just, I sort of took him off the leash, gave him a chance. He was saying, I can't wait, I can't wait. And the way that he described it, the imagery, I can just imagine of Abraham just running around him constantly being like, can I play, can I play, can I play? <laughs> and and him being like, all right, just just go, my son. Um, but the characters were important. Mostly what I love this game for, and I'm going to say this is like my favorite bit. This is a bit that actually made me regret losing Dybala which is when he oh took out God. imagine when he took out his shin pan and was like look at me winning the world cup to Gwen Doozy <laughs> that for me was the here's the thing yeah I hate antagonistic behavior I hate it sometimes when players just just engage in a lot of this shithousery but this kind of level of shithousery this this is like my bread and butter I live <laughs> for this I mean I I watch Italian football for this this was so petty brilliant level of shithousery that made me think oh you've got to come back to Juve and do this and like guys and I miss you like I miss you I love that I loved it it was just absolutely brilliant and um <laughs> Gianluca Mancini is just you know walking around with that flag that has the rat on and was like oh I'm, I'm sorry I had no idea like you know like <laughs> genuinely seems like he really had no idea what he was doing but this is a man who has always said that his idol in defense from all the Italian defenders in the world, his idol and the man whose tattoo, the number of his shirt tattooed on his body is Materazzi. Imagine <laughs> thinking Materazzi is your idol Lisa, as a defender. Marco Materazzi won us a World Cup, so Marco Materazzi will forever be all right in my book. I'm not just talking about getting Zidane sent off. He scored, by the way. Let's not forget um, Marco That's Materazzi true. had had more interacted, more involvement in that than, than just the thing that everyone talks about with him. Um, it was, I mean, it was, it was, that was what I enjoyed about it as well. It was a derby. Like it, you want the derby to be, um, there's a line you don't want it to cross. And unfortunately the Rome derby almost always does cross it. I think that once again, we had um, some running battles outside and that stuff's never good. Um, and perhaps there's always an argument should players be setting a better example, but I'm with you. <laughs> when a player pulls out his shin pad and has Literally a picture of him winning the World Cup. So Guendouzi, for context, in case anyone didn't know this, there'd been an altercation between Guendouzi and Dybala. And Guendouzi was in the French team that lost the World Cup final to Argentina, but he was on the bench. He didn't play, but Bit he was there. Player. Yeah, so the idea that, I mean, you just think to yourself, did Dybala plan that? Did he think before the game, maybe this will happen? I'll wear these shin pads. He's probably wearing those shin pads every game because he's won the World Cup. But it's just extraordinary. Um and and petty and very funny. Um, Mancini's is a, I mean, Mancini's a bit of an idiot just because he's going to get suspended for it. Most likely, they're investigating it. They haven't made a judgment yet. And if you wave around a big flag with a, with your opponent's colours and a rat on it, you're probably going to get in some trouble for it. Um, but I I also suppose I can understand losing the run of yourself. He's a defender who doesn't score very often, and I think he threw his shorts into the crowd. He, he generally was <laughs> not at his most controlled um, at the end of that game. 
that's often been one in Italian football as well, isn't it? You know, it, in other parts of the world, you limit yourself to sort of throwing your shirts in. But the, the amount of times we've seen sort of muscular Italian men just wearing wide fronts stood by the curva down the years is... Uh, Cassano. How many times do I see Cassano in his pants in his career? Mirko Vucinic, I feel like difference. he was always in his pants as well. Vucinic, ex-Roma yes, player really as well. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Probably during his Juve time as well. But um, what I liked as well, coming back to the sort of symmetry of it again, it was... Um, De Rossi had spoken about his first derby as a player and how Mancini, the Brazilian, had scored a back heel in that game. And mm. we went full circle from Mancini to Mancini, same spelling, but um, mm. Mm. but uh, a different pronunciation. And um, it's weird, this stuff about rats, because it seems to be a real sort of common refrain for fan bases to, to chide one another over. You know, it's, an, it's a common insult amongst supporters. Topo di Fogna, you know, sewer rat, gutter rat, quite literally. So uh, that's probably what Mancini was going for there. But yeah, it had the usual, the usual stuff, unfortunately, surrounding the, the derby. And um, Dybala not only showed his shin pads, but I think there was also a still of him grabbing his, uh, his balls post-match in the direction of Genduzi. So uh, yeah, it, was, it reminded me a bit of uh, Emi Martinez, um, who I know Nicky's a fan of, uh, ex-Arsenal goalkeeper, um, with his, uh, was it the golden glove, wasn't it, that he was holding down yeah. by his uh, abdomen, let's put it that way. Mm. It's terrible, isn't it? Because I, I simultaneously sort of think that you sort of I have to have certain levels of responsibility as a footballer to, to not set a bad examples, but I did laugh a lot when Amy Martinez did that at the top, and I have to admit it, and Dybala made me laugh again this time. So, <laughs> See it's, that? It's weirdly you enough. You can't take all the emotion out of football. You can't. There has to be some, there has to be some of that nonsense allowed. I thought, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought like Argentina's level of shithousery when they won the World Cup was bordering on the annoying for me because it was mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, like they just were so almost rude <laughs> in the way that they celebrated. But Dybala doing that was so like a kid going up to being like, I want, I want. I just, there was just this bit it's about so it. It's so childish. It's, and I, it's so childish, but in a funny way. That's the thing. Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't offensive. It was just, it was funny. I don't know. I found it so funny. Um, I don't know whether it's my childish humor, but <laughs> in all honesty, like if I'm I'm choosing, I mean, I started off my, I was going to say my career, but I started off my childhood as being a Lazio fan. And Igor Tudor is obviously a Juventus player. So if there was anyone that I could choose in this, I should have been choosing Lazio for this as a, you know, as a neutral, if I was going to side with a team. And yet I found myself so desperate for Roma to win. And I and I don't know whether you get carried away with the Daniele De Rossi narrative, um, whether it's watching him, you know, sort of lead this team as a as a as a captain, as a great player, as a legend, um, to now, you know, doing it as a coach. But there is also something about Igor Tudor, and I am a little bit worried about that too. It's a baptism of fire to come in and have to play Juventus twice and then Roma. I mean, it's not an easy schedule. But there is a part of me that's like I, I dislike the way that you've spoken throughout. And I'm, I'm, I've not been really happy with the way that he's presented himself in the media. We spoke about this last week. And he said, I want to change everything. His team looked so confused at some point on a tactical level. And I, and I just thought that, you know, having all these ambitions and coming in to try to show us how to play the Igor Tudor way, to, to, to show us that, you know, these are your strengths. You play with this kind of formation. You want this kind of high press with a team that you haven't had a full summer to train, to give them the athletic condition that they may need. How much is this about Lazio not really being a team that has, I guess, threatened at all this season? And how much is this about Roma's story? I think this depends kind of what, what you mean by how much is it about. I mean, are we going to talk about that RC when he is the kid who grew up to to be the captain eventually after being Capitan Futuro and now gets to Mr. Presente, the, the current manager? Of course, we're going to talk about him. Of course, it's going to be his story. If we're talking about on footballing terms, is there more to it than than, than just that? Yes, I, I think that's you'll have a... a as important a sort of thread in this story and, and how we get this result. Um, I think that you, you just said it, Mina, ridiculously hard set of games to come into. He did win the first one against Juventus Igor Tudor, but to have to then go and play them again, what, three days later in the cup and then come back for, for a derby, it's, it's asking a lot. And, and he said as much. Um, to me, there's player for player, since Milinkovic Savage left and we've talked this to death this season, it wasn't really well, well replaced. There's a clear talent gap between Roma and, and Lazio. I think if I go player for player through those teams, I, there's no question in my head that Lazio have more, that Roma have a more talented team. 
Um, but I also think it's reasonable for Tudor to say, look, I've been here a week. We played three games in seven days. It's too much for the squad we have right now. I think he's right. And by the way, Maurizio Sarri was talking endlessly about how his squad was not apt to the amount of games they were playing before he left as well. He's caught between think- a rock and a hard place, yeah, though, sorry. isn't he? In the sense that, um, you know, he's clearly been recruited because Sarri has resigned and Lazio want to go with something <laughs> different, which is why they've identified his profile in the first place. So the reason he's in a job is because they want to break with that 4-3-3 system. They want to go with something different. So he's right to try and incorporate his ideas. His ideas are naturally quite complex, like any modern coach worth their salt would have complex footballing philosophies. So you either take the very short-term view and say, there's nothing I can do with the volume of games that we have. We don't have enough training sessions at Fort Melo to to properly work on these concepts. So we're better off sticking to what we do and waiting for the summer. But equally, he also needs to get results between now and the end of the season to justify why he's been hired in the first place. So I think it's a very tough balance to strike. I think there was a bit of... uh, (sighs) It was slightly misleading, that result against Juventus. Yes, they were bold. Juventus were poor. But if Lazio don't score that added time goal, then maybe we're talking about a goalless draw to start. They haven't then scored. You know, maybe we're talking about three games without scoring if Marusic doesn't mm-hmm. score that header. And that's the young kid, Sekulov, for Juventus on his debut who loses Mar- Marusic in the first place. So I think there's huge work to be done. I don't envy him at all. I think there's almost an impossible task, back-to-back games against Juventus and then the derby to start with. And I think we can only start to judge Tudor properly as and when he's had 10 games of next season. But the problem is you have to judge him because it's football and he needs to get results (laughs) between now and the end of the season. Otherwise, they could find themselves in the bottom half of the table, Lazio. You know, it's an interesting thing that we should sort of perhaps discuss about coming coaches coming in, you know, because a lot of the times we've spoken about, you know, he hasn't changed everything like Inzaghi with Conte or Allegri with Conte. It was it was a slow change and incorporating their ideas slowly. And then you have a look at sort of Daniele De Rossi, who came in at Roma and the team went from being a low block that defended with all their lives to being a very attacking, com- compact team. So I wonder, you know, what is the right way to come in and, and, you know, do you shake up a squad straight away? Do you introduce your idea slowly? That's probably a discussion for, for another day. But I mm-hmm. think that it's um it's worth noting that De Rossi doesn't have the job. There were rumors about uh, Manuel Pellegrini coming in, which he's had to deny because it's probably worth mentioning that there, was, there wasn't a La Liga round because they had the Copa del Rey to play. So Spanish uh, teams were off for up to 10 days they haven't played football so a lot of the coaches have gone away he went away with his family Pellegrini to Rome and because he went to watch the match people now think he's going to be the next coach of Roma De but Rossi it has to be given the job full-time now, that's what I was going to ask two year, two <laughs> year contracts already been drafted for De Rossi apparently they're yeah. just waiting to uh, to actually officially consign it so I think that's pretty much uh, nailed yeah. on at this stage Given the Friedkins have been pretty upfront all the way along that getting back in the Champions League was number one goal. If he delivers the Champions League, which is like it's it's not done, uh, Atalanta, if they win the game in hand, are, are still within uh, three points. It's still not certain that Italy will get the fifth Champions League spot. It looks likely, but it's not done yet. Um, but if he gets them into the Champions League, I think even if you think, and I'm sure some people do, in fact, I know people do because they wrote it all under my column this week. Um, that even if you think he's just another Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, you kind of just have to let him do it. You kind of let it, have to let, him, let him have that chance if he's earned it. Um, and, and I think there's reasons to believe he's more than just Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, actually. I, I'm surprised that anyone thinks that because the, the, the level of the way that the m- team moves, the tactical movement, like he's just not. But anyway. Well, yeah, I, I think there's just the different stories, really, when you get into it. it De Rossi is the son of a coach. He's someone who grew up with with someone who ran Roma's youth system for a really long time. I think there's there's a completely different context to his life story. And I think there was an assumption perhaps when he came in that he wouldn't know anything about coaching. And I, I still don't think we can say anything like, oh, he's the next great Italian manager. But I think he's he's shown he's got at least some some more to him than 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 people might have assumed. And fans are always willing to give you time to learn on the job when you are indeed a legend or somebody that belongs to them. And when so. you win the derby. That's the other thing with yes. Tudor as well. For both of these men, these games matter most in Rome. They just do. They just do indeed. Okay, so that's done. And Roma continue to push for a top four place. But like we said, top five may well be enough for Champions League in uh, Serie A. Let's move on to Inter because we haven't spoken about them. And uh, this was a tricky game against Udinese. Because they actually went a goal behind. Um, Patrick, you were commentating on this particular match. 
and I was <laughs> I was I was listening as as you were talking about the mix up that led to Udinese's first goal. Uh, obviously, Inter then get a penalty, and then Fratesi comes in with one of his glorious uh, abilities to score a tap in at the the end of the game to seal the win and then set up this perfect narrative that they go to the Derby and potentially win the second star, the Scudetto, at San Siro in the, against Milan. Um, and Patrick, two yellow cards for Lautaro Martinez and Pavard so that they would miss Cagliari, so that they are all available for Milan as well. So a little bit of a Mourinho-style tactics there too from Inter. Um, what do you think? I mean, I, I don't want to say, do you think they're going to beat Milan? But... <laughs> Well, it's it's a tricky one. It's 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 interesting actually because when I saw those two yellow cards and they were both late on, it was still one all. So there was a hint of desperation about Inter because had they drawn, then everything would have been shelved in terms of those plans. But you know, Pavan and uh, and Lautaro, they were both quite cynical challenges. So I'm not sure whether it was a deliberate yellow card or not. I feel like if you are trying to get to get booked, you do it much earlier in the game, and then uh, you know the sort of suspension is is done. And it was it's always a very difficult sort of balancing out there when you're broadcasting as to whether to allude to that without, you know, outright <laughs> accusing the players of, of cynicism or, or even cheating. Basically, I guess it's not cheating, is it? It's, it's being cynical. But anyway, coming to the, to the main story itself, I think it's, it's a strange one because if you think about it, the last time Inter won the Scudetto under Antonio Conte, the Scudetto was sealed with, the, with a game at the Mappe Stadium in Reggio Emilia, it was Atalanta failing to beat Sassuolo and into a Champions without playing. Um, Milan go to Reggio Emilia next, which is the ground where they won the Scudetto two years ago. And if Milan were to lose to Sassuolo and then Inter beat Cagliari later that day, we might even have Inter as being champions before the derby. It's unexpected, but Sassuolo are Milan's bogey team. Sassuolo are scrapping for their lives. And we saw last night with Udinese who are in a relegation battle, just how awkward these fixtures can be. I think I've been hearing a lot of talk about how easy, I know we'll get to Atalanta later on, but there's been a lot of talk about how easy Atalanta's running is because they're playing X, Y, and Z. But what you find is, unless you find, unless you're up against those teams that are in mid-table, and there's a very small band of mid-table teams at the moment, maybe only Genoa, Monza, and Torino. Unless you're playing those, everyone else has something tangible to play for. So I think that, Inter's home game against Cagliari won't be a formality, especially with Cagliari having beaten Atalanta. But it was great to see again because Fratesi got his first Inter goal in the derby. That came in added time. He was the one who scored the winning goal against Verona on Epiphany. So that was Inter's first league game of 2024. They won 10 in a row from there. They've only dropped two points that game against Napoli. And it looked like they were going to drop more points. And what I loved was just the outpouring of emotion and the reaction to this goal. It felt like that they they had done the hardest bit. I think they believe it will be a formality. They'll beat Cagliari and then they'll back themselves to beat Milan in yet another derby, having won five from five in 2023. I thought the reaction to it was really interesting because I, I, I do think that as journalists, we've been guilty. I, I, I think I've been guilty of looking at this title and sort of treating it for a while as a foregone conclusion because they've been so far in front. And I, and I do think it's a foregone conclusion. I do, do think they're mm. going to win. But I think that in some ways, as as viewers and as and as journalists, we can allow that to to almost downgrade it in some way in our minds. Like, so it's you know it's not such a big deal because they've been doing it for such a long time. And I think that that celebration was a very sort of vivid visual reminder that they've worked really bloody hard for it. Like, it's not that the fact that they've made it look easy doesn't mean that it's easy. The fact that they've made it look easy just is a reflection of how good they've been. And the fact that it's not perhaps the season that we believed they could have where they could have gone far in the Champions League as well doesn't make it actually less of a deal for them to win Serie A because most of those players will win league titles. Either for some it will be the first time they've ever won one, for some it will be one of a very small handful of, of league titles they win in their career. Of course, there's always something bigger, right? There's always the World Cup, there's always the, the Champions League, but but there is a limited window you have as a professional footballer to win big European domestic league titles and, and these players have, have really earned it. So it was a really, um, it was a great celebration, as, as Patrick says. Um, I, I do need Fratesi to do this for Italy in the summer, need him to be that that super last minute game winner for us. Just just putting that on record now. But um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a, a, a felt like a, another well-deserved moment of 
celebration for Inter. They've they've been better than this this season. This wasn't their best ever performance, but that willingness to go to the end of games has been one of their their traits domestically, at least. Yeah, and we have to recognise the fact that we've seen this team provide the convince, uh, the consistency that you require of champions. Chana Loglu has been bringing in so, for so much this season. It would be very interesting for him to win the title against Milan. Um, he's trying to to keep a poker face about all of it. Um, but it's also, this is... That would really be a moment. If, he, if he scores the goal <laughs> that seals the... the Which is the quite likely, the given he takes penalties as well. You know, you can easily get right, a penalty in the yeah. derby. Can you imagine the celebrations? And his first inter goal I mean, came in the derby as well. Would you not take out a shin pad and just show it to Ibrahimovic? <laughs> yeah, that's what I would well, do, what, right? What, what would he have on it? What would he have on it? Would he have um, AI making yeah, the sort point. of predicting what the title <laughs> celebrations would look like? You know, so an open top yes. bus with Inter fans surrounding it and, you know, the Inter players uh, doing chants, derogatory chants in the direction of Ibrahimovic. I tell you what, what really felt like it was, it was, you know, you know, you just sometimes you, I mean, we know Inter are going to win the league, but it's just like we knew that when Napoli were going to win the league and, and someone made a very good comparison last he, uh, last night to me on Twitter said it felt like Raspadori's added time volley against Juventus when it was the sort of final hurdle that overcome for Napoli last last season but what it reminded me of a bit last night was how different Inter are, Inter are to, to two years ago because that Sommer mistake is not dissimilar really to the Radu mistake at Bologna it's a slapstick goalkeeping moment you know it was Radu scoring an own goal with that Pedersic throw back to him and he swept it almost it was going across the line and 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 Nicola Sansone tucked it home. And, and this was Samarjic just with a shot which just deflected off Carlos Augusto. Dumfries could have stepped in and cleared it. Sommer should have grabbed it. Neither player did anything. And the ball went into the net. And you think, after all the brilliance, after you've been almost flawless throughout this season, to not be able to win the title with five games to spare against your great rivals, who you're trying to get to 20 titles ahead of, because of one mm. shocking moment like that, it just would have felt very unfair. So I think Inter almost deserved to go on and get that winner. And Fratesi just shows that he, he seems to have a knack for knowing where the ball drops because that was his fourth attempt of the match. And eventually it was one he couldn't really miss. I, I had this stat that I was going to bring in and now I've sort of seen something else and it's making me sort of laugh at it because I was thinking, um, talking about the end of games and Inter being the Fino a la Fina team really this season, being what, what Juventus have always wanted to find themselves as. The last 15 minutes of Serie A games, uh, Inter have outscored opponents 18 goals to one. So if you just play the last 15 minutes, 18 goals to one. And that's a pretty astonishing statistic, right? No one else is close to that. The thing is, though, because it's Inter, you could pick a different time in the game and go, first 15 minutes, well, they've outscored opponents 10 to nil in the first 15 minutes. So actually, they're just outscoring everyone all the time is the point, really, isn't it? And, yeah. And um, dare, I, really dare I say it, I don't think statistics... They don't discriminate with uh, with added time. So there were seven minutes of added time in yeah. Udine last night. Actually, seven awarded. They eventually played nine. So if you think about it, that last window is always just like the window going into half time. But mm. typically, you'd only get two or three minutes max at half time. Whereas ever since the Qatar World Cup, I feel like we're getting five or six minutes minimum. To be honest, I just want a second to say that. Um... I wrote a piece because Inzaghi is being linked to some big jobs and I was going through some of the, the my my research on Inzaghi over the years and on April 4th, so on the 1st of April last year, they lost to Fiorentina Inter and Gazzetta dello Sport at the time had written, it would be ludicrous to imagine that Inzaghi would still keep his job at the end of the season and unless he wins the Champions League and that would be utopian. And it was, it's incredible to see how one year later, the man reached the Champions League final, is winning the Scudetto, and he is finally being recognized for the, for the brilliant tactician that he has been, not just at Inter, but at Lazio. So you know how we were all a little bit happy for Sadi when he was winning at Juventus because he deserved it. He deserved to lift the Scudetto. Spalletti deserved mm -hmm. to, to win it. I think yeah. this is Inzaghi's moment, and he really, really deserves to be up there to, to get the plaudits. And I feel like he's been fighting the shadow of Antonio Conte for so long after he arrived. And then it was, our team wasn't performing. And, you know, we look at this team and I'm still not convinced that they're all superstars, by the way. I think there are a lot of many good players, but I look at Mkhitaryan and I think that you made this guy <laughs> such a brilliant force and you've made so many others and you've, you know, you've, you've addressed a lot of the weaknesses that people have accused you of before. So congratulations to him. It's not going so well, of course, at Juventus, <laughs> um, but Allegri did finally get the win. 
there was all these uh, rumors about how much he's been shouting at the team, how much, you know, they, they risked going and, and conceding at the final minute because once again, you know, Juve can only play for one half. That could be the first half. That could be the second half. Take your pick. It's always exciting to know which half they're going to show up in. You know, that's about <laughs> as exciting as it gets when you're a Juventus fan at the moment. Are they going to start off really well or are they going to end it really well? Either way, it was... Um, it was a 1-0 victory over Fiorentina, which means they're back to winning ways. I don't think we need to talk about them very much because obviously we've covered them, you know, so often. Um, but it's probably it's probably worth noting that Fabrizio Romano has talked about the fact that he thinks Allegri will leave at the end of the season um, and that this is his final year. There is There does seem to be a disconnect. Um, but interestingly, more than ever, I've seen a lot of pro-Allegri comments this week. So I wonder what's going on there. A lot of people blaming whether that the squad for being so mediocre that it's almost impossible to represent Juventus with this level of talent. Um, either way, Vlaovic seems to be a Juventus level player. I, I mean, is is it just a la legge immutabile del X, the the immutable law of the X? Is it that, or is it? I mean, I think he's a very good player. But I've constantly maintained that, to be honest. I don't think he's necessarily world class, but I think he's one of the five best strikers in, in Italy. And but and actually, I would say five best forwards. You know, I, I would. You know, he's one of the best number nines, best if not two. the best number nine. Um, if I not the best, oh, you think he's better than Osman or Lautaro? I think so Lautaro is more of a nine yeah, and a half. I think Vlahovic, that's probably true. in terms of potential, is better than Giroud. I think Giroud's off to. Major League Soccer now, isn't he? But um, yeah, I think if if you put him in goal scoring positions, he he can score more goals than he's got more to his game than, than Giroud. I'm a big Giroud fan, don't get me wrong, but I think uh, Giroud has the difference between Giroud and Vlaovic is Giroud has squeezed out every last drop of talent through intelligence and work That's rate, um, whereas I think Vlahovic can occasionally be a little bit complacent and his temperament still lets him down. Um, and but can Vlaovic jump 233 meters like Osman? 233 not, meters. Well, wow. I mean, yeah, that, <laughs> that was, would be quite a gesture. That was not 233. <laughs> Superman. Picture us yeah. leaping over skyscrapers. Sorry, sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. Look where my mind. <laughs> Imagine. I mean, that, that was. Uh, I mean, that's. It's amazing, isn't it? That that goal for 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 Osimhen was almost the. Uh, the least memorable when it, when he scored, it was it was the equaliser. You think that's an incredible header, and then Napoli went on to score some even better goals than there. But I, no, I think I think you're right. I don't think there's much to say about Juventus, save for the fact that they are the third best team in Serie. A. I think they'll end up as the third best team in Serie. A. I don't see them overhauling Milan. I don't see them necessarily being caught now after Bologna could only draw at Frosinone. And um, I think it is time now to break with the past with with Allegri. I think it's time for a new coach to come in. And what a situation to inherit. You know, you've got a slightly disgruntled fan base. You've got young players with big potential possibly coming back to the club, certainly to have a look at them in the summer. Matthias Soleil, Dean Hoysen, and so on and so forth. You're going to have Champions League football and you're going to be involved in the Club World Cup. So whoever gets that job, if there is a vacancy, is going to have um, a really interesting first season. God willing, it is Zinedine Zidane. But um, I do want to talk about Atalanta because they have an upcoming, what well, their upcoming game is against Liverpool. They lost to Cagliari. Um, Ranieri, by the way, doesn't get enough of a mention for how good Cagliari has been recently. I mean, I, I looked at their games in 2024 and there's only two matches out of 13, I believe, that they haven't scored. So they always come up with a goal. They've got the second amount of goals coming from substitutions. Only Milan has done better with their substitutes than what Cagliari has managed with theirs. More importantly, they've recovered, um, I think, 15 to 16 points from from by coming back games. So so going 1-0 down or 2-0 down and coming back. So dis disadvantageous positions. I don't know how well how to explain this. I feel like I, I don't know the positions. right wording from losing saying it. Positions. Losing positions. Thank you. It's very, very simple. Um, but coming back from losing positions, they are, I think only Napoli has done better in recovering points from losing positions. So Cagliari overall, I mean, it really shows you that the strength of Ranieri, and more importantly, the, the way in which they score goals at the, at the final 15 minutes of matches, which shows a never say die attitude. And they are in a relegation battle. Um, they, 
yet there's something about them that makes it seem like it would be so disastrous for this team to to go away. I, I mean, the way that they have been under Ranieri this season deserves a lot more attention. But of course, them winning against Atalanta means that this was the second loss of Atalanta in a row. The other coming against Fiorentina midweek um, in the uh, in the Coppa Italia. And of course, we had a, a voice note on that. Is it over for Atalanta? Can, you know, they have Liverpool coming up. They seem to be exhausted. I mean, you look at this team, it's, it's trying to do what's all at the moment. But can they make Champions League when you consider the form of Bologna, when you consider the form of Roma and, and the schedule that they have? Some say it's quite easy. Yeah, I, I, there's two conversations to have around there. Like I've got my head on Cagliari and, and, and Ranieri because, of course, there was that extraordinary game against Fosinona earlier in the season where they were losing by three goals after yeah. the 70th minute, came back to win 4-3. Never happened before in Serie A. They've been doing it. They've um, got the 95th minute equaliser against Napoli more recently. They've been doing it all season, as you say, Mina, and, and Ranieri has has absolutely been getting every last ounce of, of everything out of everyone, frankly. Nicolas Viola with four goals this season is what? 35, I think. He's he's certainly no spring chicken, but as a, as a bit part player. Um, he's close to it, isn't he, Viola? I'm going to check Wow, that's amazing. 34. 88, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so... Uh, so he's 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 doing an extraordinary job and 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 that needs to be credited for sure. Atalanta do feel like a team that's running out of steam at the wrong moment. Um it's really unfortunate. It's it's terrible timing going into that game against Liverpool and perhaps it will turn out that's just because they've been keeping something in reserve for Liverpool. But I I do think there was maybe a little bit in this game specifically um of complacency. They certainly had had a a brutally physical game against Fiorentina midweek. Mm. I talked about that on my voice mm. note. It was a really violent game of football. Mm. Um, and I guess when uh, when they uh, when they got in front so early here with Scamacca, there might have been a little bit of, God, we could do with an easy game here because we've got Liverpool coming up next. And and perhaps that led them into a bit of complacency. But they, they really do seem, um, in an odd way, because there are still things in the team that, that are good. Coop Miners is still playing some brilliant passes. Um, Skamaka scoring is obviously encouraging. Uh, Adamola Lookman still gets himself into interesting positions, but they just feel like they've they've lost a little bit of that momentum that you need in this last part of the season. There was a big um, absentee. They're without Giorgio Scalvini for a month. And I know he's had mm. his detractors, but he's, he's very accomplished. And that has really disrupted the rotations for Gasparini as well, because they signed Isak Hien from Verona in January. And recently he's become a first team regular. He's been excellent. We saw it against Napoli in particular, completely nullifying Osimhen. And Hien was given a rest. Rafael Toloi came in. That's because Scalvini's injured and Gasparini doesn't want to play the same back three for every single game. And they've got lots of matches coming up. So he thought, I'll rest Hien so that he's fit enough for the Liverpool game and he's fresh and we'll give Toloi a chance. But Toloi hadn't started a game since October. And it showed, despite him being the club captain. They've got uh, Palomino, who they're unwilling to play completely. He's played about 30 minutes all told all season. So I think that's the problem for Atalanta. And they haven't taken the same approach that Fiorentina have, where Fiorentina have basically said, forget about Serie A. We're going to try and qualify for Europe, either by winning the Coppa Italia or by winning the Conference League. And what will be will be domestically. Whereas Atalanta ideally would love to win the Coppa Italia because that's the most tangible trophy they're closest to that but now they've got that first leg deficit they're going to start as huge underdogs against Liverpool and yet they're in they're within touching distance of the top five as well so it, it's it's very difficult for Gasparini to get his team selection right and I think he got it wrong and I think Nicky's absolutely right they almost scored too early and didn't kick on and, and, and pursue that second goal and just on Cagliari I think they can be slightly misleading those statistics you know when you say oh they've recovered X amount of points from losing positions, it's true. But often it can just be quite coincidental that in that match they conceded first as opposed to scoring first. You know, there are teams like Liverpool in the Premier League that feel like they frequently concede the first goal and yet it feels inevitable they're going to come back. It's not obviously the same thing with Cagliari, but I think they're always going to concede because they don't keep too many clean sheets. And so as a result, for them to get points, they need to score sooner or later. And and that's that's what they managed. And um Lovely play from uh, Elder Shomorodov in uh, holding the ball up yes. for the for the first goal as well. I was always a really big fan of his. I, mm. I was always disappointed it didn't work out for him at Roma. Um, but 
it was amazing because he was being tracked by so many different defenders and still had the thought to to pass it off. Oh, anyway, I, I was really pleased for them. But there is something to be said. If I agree with you about recovering, you know, um, points and conceding first, it can happen when you're Cagliari. But it's also the never say die attitude that they have that I think is quite unusual for their level of team. Because, um, you know, it's understandable for them to be complacent sometimes. And it's understandable to say, OK, we're going to lose this one. But they never do that. They always have the right attitude, which is something that I don't think can be said about um, Atalanta, which is exactly what Gasparini said, is we need to show this level of commitment to winning games that we saw Cagliari show. And I wonder if we're going to see that against Liverpool. Do we see this being anything other than a, a comprehensive win for the for the English side? I, I think that Atalanta have the tools to hurt any team if things go right. I think when you look at that team and even look at that game against Cali, what was what was good in that performance? It was the front part of the team, right? Adam, like I said it before, Skamakic is goal well. Lookman gets into good positions. Uh, Coop Miners is certainly a player who can who can unpick defenses. You've got tools to unpick something. I I just don't see how they're going to get away um, from Liverpool without conceding three or four times the way they're playing at the moment, and I think that's the reason why it's hard to see them getting a result. They need to come so back to defense. Bergamo with max one goal deficit to have any chance of winning the tie, yeah. and I don't see it. I see them being beaten by two or three goals. Absolutely. What about the other game? So I I did a voice note on Milan, and I did, was discussing sort of links to from about them with Antonio Conte and and obviously it was my whole 18 minutes on why Pioli is just brilliant so we've Milan continue winning seventh victory in a row it's really impressive the way that they're turning around and, and finding their rhythms we can speak about the glory of Pulisic playing in the position that I actually wanted him to play at the start of the season. I really wanted it to be Chiquese out wide with Leao on the other side and Pulisic at, at behind. I know it's very it's very attacking, um, but this was the game to try it in because Ruben Loftus-Cheek was, wasn't available, um, suspended for this match. But it was brilliant to watch. It was just absolutely brilliant to watch how well that they all flow together, how well the team flows together. And I and I never felt like Pioli was, was given time to find that. And it's always... It's, it's always going to take time to find that. Regardless of all of this, they're coming up against Roma um, in the Europa League. Um, oh, we should really mention Cassano and uh, and his Odious. comments on Rafael Leao, which were just. There's another man with his pants who always wants to, and I just never know why it gives him such a platform to Desperate speak. To it's a little bit relevant. like Joey Barton. It's like Joey Barton, right? Like it's like why? Although sometimes I, he has said things in the past that I sort of agree with, but. Um, Obviously, oh, so he came out and said that he, well, he said Rafael Leao was in a world-class player. That he'd, and, he'd be in a sixth or seventh place team back in Cassano's glory days of Serie A, you know, like like Cassano yes. was playing in, you know, the late 80s into early 90s. I mean, you know, let's be honest, it was still good Serie A, don't get me wrong, at the turn of the, the new millennium. But I mean, Cassano with the rose-tinted spectacles. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I mean, if Savicevic can win a Champions League, then then Rafael Leao would not be in the seventh. Anyway, regardless of this, we don't need to give him any more airtime. But what I do want to say is that Milan are a better team than Roma. At least the league suggests that. Between these two sides, who do you think is coming into this with, with greater momentum? I mean, it's got to be the way that Milan's playing in the last seven matches. But then you think of Daniele Dorossi's team and you think... They've been there before recently. Um, they've been doing it in Europe recently. Can Roma do it again? I think De Rossi will be hugely motivated to at least make the Europa League final because it's the one stick they can beat him with when it comes to the Mourinho comparisons at the moment. You know, Mourinho was the one who brought back silverware to Roma for the first time since 2008. He was the one who won Roma's European trophy, the Conference League, nearly won the Europa League the next year. And so if De Rossi were to lose, especially against a domestic rival, it almost feels the worst possible way for you to lose in Europe is when you lose to someone you know from Serie A, because it's like, well, there's no rhyme or reason to it. You, you know them you're able to, it's not like you have to study opposition. You might be caught by surprise or, or not know what to expect. You know, De Rossi will know what to expect from Milan and vice versa. And I think the Europa League would be a great competition for Roma to win, not only for De Rossi to say, look, actually this squad is, is very good. And, and Mourinho was being slightly disingenuous when he was suggesting that he was overachieving with an average group of players to win those European trophies. But also... Above all, it gives you access to next season's Champions League 
as a seed, I think it's the best European competition that you can win, say, for the Champions League. And as we've seen, Inter notwithstanding, Italy don't have a hope of winning the Champions League at the moment. So I think Roma are going to be additionally motivated by that. The problem for them is Milan have never won the Europa League, so they have that to mm. try and achieve. And Milan are pretty much guaranteed a top four slash five finish now. So the Champions League is sorted for them. And and I think that could possibly play into it. Milan have greater scope to rotate than Roma do. And Milan are better than Roma. I, I, it's, it's a blunt thing to say, and it doesn't necessarily mean they'll win because last season Napoli uh, strolled to the league title and yet um, they lost to Milan in the Champions League. So it doesn't always follow that the best team is going to win, even if they know each other domestically. But Milan are better than Roma. They're, they're the second best team in Italy, uh, quite confidently now, now that Juventus have fallen away. They're, they're on a really strong run of form. Talking before about Pioli and, and perhaps him not getting all the, the, the credit he deserves for, for how well Milan have played actually recently. Um, Pulisic is playing at a really, really high level right now. Um, he's going to be the real focal point of this team, the way things are going at the moment once Giroud leaves in the in the summer. Um, they have They have more about them than Roma do. Roma have improved under Dersi. I think they're in a much better place than they were, for instance, when they lost to Milan when they last played in, in January under Mourinho. But do I think they're a better team than Milan? No, I think Milan are the second best team in Italy and I think they were, um, well, I think they're, they're a Champions League caliber team playing in, in the Europa League. They're not a team that I would say should win the Champions League, but they're a Champions League caliber team and they're playing in the Europa League. But isn't Roma a Champions League caliber team? Not, They're on the not way yet. there. I'm not sure they've they've proved it yet. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm wondering if Daniel De Rossi started this year as the coach, whether or not they would have. Because you look on paper, right, and you think there's a lot of talent there, mm. and it hasn't really like we're starting to see it. But you you do think like Pellegrini, Dybala, Lukaku, like there's there's a lot of talent there that we haven't seen the best of Paredes. You know, people who won the the World Cup. So. It'll be very interesting to see what happens with Roma next season because I was reading an article in Corriere dello Sport the other day. They said 18 players have their futures sort of up for debate, really, uncertainty, you know, with sort of the players like Lukaku or being on loan and Renato Sanchez and Asmoon and there's just loads of them and Hoysen and players out of contracts, Binatola, etc. So it would be interesting to see if De Rossi is in charge, what his squad looks like next season. But just one final thing you mm. mentioned on, on paper there. I think on paper, Milan are much closer actually to Inter than the league table suggests. And I might have to enlist okay. the help of the archivista that, that I know at Milan, the, you know, the guy who works on the archive, because I'd love to know the statistics from Milan's league results when they've had their best 11 to pick from, because they've been decimated from injuries through injuries all season long. Very rarely have they been mm. able to pick their best back four, and it's been defensive frailties which have cost them. Very rarely have you looked at them and seen a Milan side, they're incapable of scoring goals. But, you know, they've, they've, they had all sorts of injuries to Mori and Kalulu and then Teo Hernandez for a time, you know, Calabria, the, um, Chow. There's every single play, you know, and then you can argue, well, that's part of running a club successfully is your, you know, fitness training and your medical department and so on and so forth. But I would love to see purely given another season with this group of players with another couple of additions yes. next summer to see how close yes. they could get to Inzaghi's into next season. So I think on that basis... I would agree that, that Milan are the superior team. But that doesn't mean necessarily, especially with the second leg in Rome, that, that Roma can't get the better of them. But I, you're so right about that. The, the fact is, is that, you know, all these players that they bought in the transfer market, you think it's so many different ones. And yet most, nearly all of them have worked out. I mean, they've all, they've all been brilliant. I mean, Loftus-Cheek and, and Pulisic, probably the two Eunice standout Musa. players. I don't know if we can say Chick Wes has been brilliant. He had a good game at the weekend. Well, He's had a very up and thing. down. But if you start looking at his statistics recently, there's a, a general uptick in his performances. We're starting to see the Chukwese that we saw from Villarreal. And and, and, and he is even bettering some of this, like Pioli was talking about, from the statistics that he was showing back when he was mm. playing in La Liga. I think that, you see, it's quite hard to come into a new team and show the brilliance straight away. I think it was easy for Pulisic. He made it look easy. So we sort of started to expect that from everyone else. But then you look at, you know, him, I think that I think Chukwese is going to be brilliant next season. I'm so excited to see what he can produce and, and going forward. I think Gabia coming in and showing that level of performance at the back is is really impressive. And and I look at this team and I think, oh my god, imagine one season where they now really know each other. I mean, Rinders has been fantastic. Like Adley has put in some great performances. And this is a midfield that was completely changed, completely changed because Benazir wasn't available at the start of this, the season. 
and you look at that they'd lost you know big big players like Tonali and Ibrahimovic and from leadership as well and to to create this level of of comfort in playing with each other and understanding tactical a tactical understanding and rhythm I I think it's he deserves at least one more year because I think this team could be really exciting. Maybe we can continue creating these wonderful cycles in football <laughs> where it's like Inter and then Milan <laughs> and then maybe Napoli will come back and then maybe, <laughs> and then maybe Juventus will win again. We never know. Mina, you know? just one final but... point on that. You made a really good comparison there between Chukwese and, and Pulisic because that's obviously what supporters do. They see two wingers come in and, and they naturally mm. compare them. And as you said, Pulisic the hit the ground running. Well. Yeah, exactly. Pulisic hit the ground running, scored in his debut against Bologna, never looked back. He's now into double figures, I think, for league goals. And Chukwese took his time. Then he obviously went to AFCON as well. And what I found was interesting was um, was Pioli saying, uh, they, they asked him recently, they said, what does Chukwese need to do to be more like... Uh, no, what, they basically said, what's the difference between Chukwese and, and Pulisic? And, and he said, Pulisic scores goals, creates goals and works very hard for the team. And they said, what does Chukwese need to do? They, and he said, score goals, create goals and, and work very hard for the team. So Pioli, I think, has been very good in terms of when to use the carrot and when to use the stick. It was clearly the stick with Chukwese. This is about three weeks ago. And, and the proof is in the pudding. Since then, performances, he's getting goals, he's providing assists and um, it's made a big difference. Yeah. He was he was definitely my player to watch out when to, to look out for when he first came in. He was the one I was most excited about because he's just such a direct threat, and I think there's a lot of untapped potential there. That he was so fun to watch in La Liga, and I and I st- I'm very I'm convinced he's going to be a huge standout player for Milan. So just just a little bit more time for us to really see what he's capable of. Um, just want to uh, move on quickly just to say that Bologna dropped points against Frosinone. Um, that was a nil-nil. We didn't expect that, to be honest with you, but a lot has been said about Atalanta's away form. But actually, if you look at Bologna's away form, there's a big difference. 20 points away from home, 38 points at home. So there is certainly not the same level of, of, of performance that we get from Bologna when they travel than the one that we get from them at home. Of course, that takes nothing away from their brilliant season. Moving on to Napoli, Osman scored a goal by uh, scored the equaliser by jumping not 233 meters, but rather <laughs> 223 centimeters. He started outside of the stadium, just leapt into the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he to be fair, he does wear a mask. Do you know what I mean? A cape is not out of the question. So. Maybe last season he was mean, capable of, of jumping 233 meters. <laughs> not this year, yeah. Patrick, my only fear is that I've said this on radio. <laughs> I just feel like nobody might have like realized because you know. Anyway, I'm like, have I said this before? Because I'm so convinced it was meters, I didn't even question it. Um, but either way, <laughs> Napoli had a terrific game in the sense that you know, obviously you went to goal down in the first uh, 15 minutes. There was um there was a uh, protest being carried out by their fans. Um, they didn't show up. It was an away game for the first 15 minutes. Hung a banner that said "absent like you." And then came in to see them already one goal down <laughs> against Monza, who who seemed to really love a target man today, you know, playing for Jurich. Um, either way, then they, they scored these three goals <laughs> from the 55th minute to the 61st, which were three of the most beautiful goals I think I've ever seen. And it, it was fantastic. One from Zielinski, obviously the equaliser from Osman, and then Politano with that, oh, sensational volley, sensational goal. And then Monza score with Colpani and then Raspadori responds in the end. So really end-to-end match. Great. Calzona talks about the attacking game and, and how Napoli, um, you know, this is what's brilliant about Napoli is that they have a great attacking game. It's just that defensively they've really been let down mm. this season. They're just not a secure team at the back. Um, was, neither are Bayern. It who was got a fun him. game to watch all weekend. I mean, the derby was a derby, but this was a... a it was a bit nonsense, but it was really fun to watch. Nikki, um, the last 40 minutes of Juve Fiorentina was the best, you know. Yeah. It's a good nap time. <laughs> um, but that Piotr Zielinski, he, he seems quite good. I wonder if uh, Calzano would have liked to have him in the Champions League last 16. I know, right? How how yeah. annoying. How annoying. Um, but yeah, that's the roundup of all the games. Uh, there was also an interesting 3-2 battle between Empoli and Torino. It's something you wouldn't expect. This is a game that screams under two goals, but it wasn't. Milan defeated Lecce 3-0. As you all know, Atalanta lost 2-1 to Cagliari. Salernitana and Sassuolo 2-2. And Verona lost to Genoa. Genoa, not, not the best travellers, but managed two goals 
um, against uh, Verona. Obviously, we have the Europa League qualifiers, uh, quarterfinals, my qualifiers, <laughs> Europa League quarterfinals. First leg on Thursday, it is Milan versus Roma and Liverpool versus Atalanta. And we've got the Conference League, Victoria Pilsen versus Fiorentina. I was just going to chime in real quickly on that um, before we, we, we wrap up, which is because um, Genoa with that win, pretty much you're out of that relegation conversation now, which is a really intense relegation conversation because 13th place Cagliari, 30 points, all the way down to Sassuolo in 19th. There's five points between all those teams. Um, and I, I think really like uh, Goodmanson, who assisted one and scored one at the weekend, that's the difference a lot of the time between relegation fight and not relegation fight. If you've got a 12-goal striker, that's very often going to be enough to get you out of trouble and I think he's he's been the difference for them. Hence why he's been linked with Inter amongst others uh, next summer. We've got a couple of shout outs Gregory Hill and Daniel Kane. Thank you very much for supporting us and uh, as Mina mentioned there it is a European week so Europa League and Conference League ties on the horizon. I'm sure we'll be back over the course of the week with some extra content for you there. Wrapping up those first leg matches between Milan and Roma and Liverpool and Atalanta, and Victoria Pilsen Fiorentina. But that is all for us from now, or from us for now. Thank you very much <laughs> to uh, Mina Rizuki for hosting, to uh, Nikki Bandini and producer Simon. We will see you very soon on another episode of Serie A Chronicles. Bye-bye. <laughs>